Chapter 10 Flame of Fury For the next few days, Saski stayed in the chief's house. He was carefully tended by the chief's wife, Jerob's mother. Paku came to see him every day, and he continued to get better. It was a full week before he slept in his own house again, and even after he began walking about the village, he still spent most of his time with Jerob. These two enjoyed talking, and Saski was not yet strong enough to work. A trader had come to the village of Broken Light the day after Rajan left. He was a half-caste, a Chinese Malay. He was hunting for Kajang. The people of Broken Light were skillful at making fine Kajang. The palms whose leaves are used for that purpose were especially fine on that part of the mountain. The Kajang is prepared by sewing palm leaves together into sheets. Threads of rattan are used for the sewing, and when the sheet is finished, it may measure as much as a yard and a half square. It is of double thickness. These palm leaf sheets are used for many things, for walls of houses, roofs of temporary shelters in boats or gardens, booths at the outdoor marketplaces, roofs of buffalo carts, and for covering anything that needs protection in that land of heavy rain. The trader offered a good price for 1,000 sheets of Cajun. The village people were greatly pleased and set to work gathering the palm leaves, sewing them into sheets and drying them in the sun. As the sheets were finished, they were stacked under the chief's house because it was larger than the other huts in the village, and also because the trader held the chief responsible for filling the order. The men, of whom there were about thirty, gathered the leaves while the women did the sewing, the drying, and the stacking. For days this had been going on, and while Saski sat with Jerob in the room above, they could hear the rustle of the Cajun sheets as the women worked with them under the house. The job was almost finished now. Saski looked down through one of the wide cracks in the bamboo floor. They have filled it solid under half of the house, he said. Now they are putting it here, so we can't look much longer. I wish I could go and gather palm leaves. I would like to go too, Jerob said, but it will be another two weeks before I can begin to walk. Rajan said so. He looked down at his splinted leg with a frown. Jerob tried to look down through the floor, but the splint on his leg bothered him, so Saski kept him informed. Kooning, who seemed to know the trader, was bustling about everywhere, overseeing the work and telling the women how to store the finished pieces. He appeared to have forgotten all about the God teaching and his hatred towards it. The two boys talked constantly about God and the coming baptism and little Vivi. The day had been fixed now. It was to be three weeks from the next rest day. As the boys talked, their interest grew, and their faith grew, too. "'Why don't you get baptized, too?' Jerob asked Saski one afternoon as they talked together. "'You believe in God?' "'I believe that God is here. I have heard him speak to me. I know he is powerful and kind, but my heart still flutters about like a bird in a net, struggling to be away.' My trust is not quiet and sure like yours. Jerob thought about this for a little while. Does your heart long for God? When I am in trouble, yes, my heart longs for God. But you long for him at all times. That is why you are ready and I am not, Saski sighed. The boys knew when the rest day came. Rajan had shown them how to count the days and remember the seventh one. On this day they sat in the chief's house singing snatches of songs that they could remember and talking about what they had learned of God's word. The chief and his wife joined them and laid aside all work for that day. The Kajan sheets were all finished. 
Tomorrow the trader would send coolies to carry them down the mountain to the marketplace at Inam. They were all stacked in neat piles under the chief's house. The sun was almost down when Uncle Sobat called at their door and came in to greet them and sit with them. We thought someone from Singing Water should come to see you before the rest day is over, he explained. I will stay until tomorrow morning. Then Uncle Sobat began telling them all that had taken place in his village this week, and they told him all they had been talking and thinking about, and they asked him many, many questions. Why is it that no one is walking about the village? Is everyone gone? It looked deserted when I came, Uncle Sobat said as he stood up and looked out the window. The chief said, The people have worked hard for several days, gathering palm leaves and sowing Cajun. They are tired. I suppose they are resting in their houses. I'm sure no one knows you are here, Jerob said, or they would all be crowding in here to ask news of Vivi and the baptism. I'm tired, too, Uncle Sobat said, settling himself on a mat. We will just have a quiet time here by ourselves, and if no one knows I'm here, that is good. We have much to talk about. So the sun went down and the oil lamp was lit. Paco came over to see when Sasky would be coming home. He stayed for a little while, and they all worshipped there, gathered around the lamp in the middle of the floor. Even Paku bowed his head and listened. Then Saski and his father went home. Uncle Sobat said he would sleep in the chief's house because he wanted to visit with Jerob a little longer. That night it rained. The village slept. The sheets of mist and drizzle that shrouded the mountain hid all the stars, and there was no moon. Sasky listened to the gentle beat of the rain on the roof. Peace filled his mind, and he slept. It seemed to the boy that he had scarcely closed his eyes when he was awakened by the noise of many people shrieking from all over the village. It sounded above the patter of the rain. They were calling, Fire! Fire! Sasky's first thought was to question how anything could burn on a night like this. Both Paku and Saski ran to the door and looked out. It was the chief's house. The roof was wet and black in the night. The stacks of Cajun under the floor were burning with a fierce blaze that threw an eerie glow over the surroundings. The fire had already eaten through the floor. It was falling in. Jerob, Jerob, Sasky screamed and started to dash out of the hut, but his father held him back. Look, he pointed to an approaching, staggering figure. It was Uncle Sobat. He carried Jerob in his arms. They could see how excited he was. I saw, I saw, he began. Are you hurt? Paco shouted at him. No, Uncle Sobat said. Thank God we are not burned. I will put Jerob here in your house for a little while. Where is the chief? Where is Jerob's mother? Paku screamed above the roar of the fire. Are they in there in that fire? No, they aren't there, Uncle Sobat answered as he came up into the hut and put Jerob down on a mat in the inner room. Someone came and called them. A boy came to the door and asked them both to come quickly. Doesn't the chief know that his house is burning? Sasky stood in the floor watching the fire. Oh, I'm sure he knows by now. The light can be seen all over the village, and the rain is less now. I thought only of getting Jerob out. In a minute more, he would have been burned up. That fire was quicker and hotter than any I ever saw. He couldn't possibly have gotten out by himself. The village people were running around the burning house in wild confusion. Paco and Sobat went out among them. Sasky stood in the doorway and watched. He told Jerob what he saw. 
The building burned quickly, for it was made of bamboo and thatch and cajun. The piles of dry material under the floor were protected from the rain, and they were tinder dry. They burned in a few minutes with a furious flame that nothing could resist. No one tried to do anything. They scampered about, screaming and babbling in surprise and fright. Then the old chief and his wife came hurrying up. They must have been at the far end of the village. My son, my son, the chief cried in a mighty voice. He tried to dash into the burning ruin. Many hands held him back. Jerob's mother began to wail and shriek. Then the wailing was taken up by the village women who did not know what they were wailing about. Some of them had seen Uncle Sobat carry Jerob to safety, but most of them did not know whether Jerob was safe. Uncle Sobat pressed through the weeping women and laid his hand on the chief's shoulder. Come, come, he said, Jerob is safe. Let me take you to him. The old man allowed himself to be led to Paco's house. When he saw his son sitting on the mat, smiling at him, he threw himself on the floor and sobbed like a child. It is good, it is good, he said. The God of heaven has sent Sobat to save my son. From this day my heart will follow God. Jerob's mother stood beside him with big tears running down her cheeks. She felt of his face and hair. Jerob reached up and took one of her hands in his. It's all right, mother. I am not hurt at all. God sent Sobat to save me. Who was it that called you away from the house just before the fire started? Paku asked the chief. It was a little lad, the little lad who lives in the furthest house down the mountain at the end of the village. The chief shook a trembling finger at Sobat. You see, the boy told us that one of the people in that house is very sick and that we must both come at once, even in the night and the rain. He sat down on the mat beside his son. When we got there... He looked around with dazed eyes. When we got there, no one was sick. They said it must be a mistake. The little boy made a mistake. No, how could that be? Paku's face was stern. This is a strange thing. Did the little lad who called you see Sobat in your house? No, of course not, Uncle Sobat spoke up. I didn't say anything. Jerob and I had been talking. I just put out the lamp and lay down on my mat. Certainly no one knew I was there. If he had known... What do you think started the fire? Paku took the chief by the shoulder in great excitement. Someone put fire in the Cajun under the house, the old man said. It was cooning. I saw him, Uncle Sobat said quietly. It was he who set fire to the Cajun. When the flames leaped up, I saw his face. Then he saw me and ran away. Fear and surprise struck the little group dumb when they realized Sobat had seen Kooning start the fire. Then the chief stood up. It was the witch doctor who had the boy call us away. He intended to burn Jerob alone there on his mat. But the God of heaven had already sent Sobat into your house without any person in the village seeing him. Paku began in a loud voice. He meant to burn Jerob because he loves the God of heaven. He wants to burn him because Jerob is going to be baptized and because the medicine of madness that was made against my son came to nothing and was useless. The chief got more and more excited. He talked faster and faster and lifted his voice higher and higher. The people outside heard him and began to press in the door. When the chief beckoned to them all to listen, 
and he explained to them what had happened and who did it and why, exclamations of surprise and anger came from the company. Some wanted to go right then in the rain and hunt for Kooning and punish him at once, but the chief restrained them. He had calmed down now and could talk to them with authority. Go to your houses and sleep, he told them. I will stay here in Paku's house. We can sleep in his kitchen. Tomorrow we will begin to gather materials for a new house. We will make it better than the old one, and we will make one big enough for the God of heaven so we can worship there on his holy day.